right, Ellis Cinema back, another edition. How we doing out there? Good, great, grand, a yan, a yan. Who gives a shit? Anyway, the show has been very fortunate lately, so fortunate, and we are just continuing the trend. I don't know how it just keeps happening, but you know, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. As long as I don't have to do the fucking episode myself. I'm here for it. So as you see on your screen, your dial, however, you are choosing to join us today. That's right. Us today. Brian loves you. And I just would like to point out that this is a psychological thriller. It's not a horror film. I don't I don't know why these horror. Ner- well, we'll get into the horror nerds here in a second. But I, I viewed Brian loves you as a psychological thriller. So what is Brian loves you. Well, in the early 90s, a 32-year-old psychotherapist, Jonathan, began to suspect that his small Arizona community was being taken over by, get this, gang, a homicidal religious cult known as the Followers of Brian. What starts as an innocent inquisitiveness quickly turns into a violent and harrowing fight for freedom and survival. Jonathan's entire ordeal was captured on video camera and uh, security tapes in this found footage that was recovered uh, in this found footage that was recovered. The film was shot in 17 days on a micro budget, which if you've listened to previous shows, you know, micro budget is about tree fitty. So it was shot in 2006, finally got a release in 2008. And now we have the Blu-ray packed to the gills. I mean, and even the, I'm so glad that some of the featurettes weren't like four minutes long. I get so annoyed when it's like, oh, we got an interview with so-and-so and it's four and a half minutes long. I hate that. In fact, the one with George Wentz, 44 minutes, loved it. Absolutely loved it. But uh, we get this release from the MVD Marquee Collection. Brian Loves You stars Candy Stanton, George Went, Tiff, uh, George Went, Tiffany Sheppis, Daniel Roebuck, Brink Stevens, Bobby Slayton, Tony Todd, Tom Noga, Lloyd Kaufman, and you're going to have to wait for the final one. So as I was telling my guest before uh, we turned on the mics here, can't stand doing this show. Can't stand it unless I know for a fact I'm going to have a good time if I bring a guest on. And well, I mean, I between the featurettes and the commentary, it's, it's going to be easy work. It's going to be easy work. So producer, writer, director, Seth Landau jo- joining the Ellis Cinema podcast for the first time. Seth, I'm glad we could finally make it happen. I was dying for the last couple of weeks, which is why we had to delay Sorry it. To hear that. Actually. Yeah, well, you know, you start voiding out of both ends and perhaps trying to be entertaining on a microphone isn't the best course of action. So Mm-mm, take care uh, of yourself. <laughs> I appreciate you coming on, sir. Uh, th- I just want to tell you, and I'm going to blow smoke throughout this. I, I love this movie. I, I was so uncomfortable. And in fact, and then we'll get there. We'll get there. This is what I always do. I always ruin shit that I had planned to talk about later. The tonal shift that you acknowledge in the commentary, I think it's the it's jarring in the best of ways. I was so uncomfortable from when the tone shifts until we we get to the the crazy ending. And I'm a, like when I say uncomfortable, like I mean like edge of my seat like i was bummed dude i was just but like holy shit how did we end up here and we'll, we'll talk about that but you know god damn it horror fans are so fucking toxic i swear to god dude. The, the, <laughs> the whole, it's it's wild to me um but, but we'll, we'll talk about it so if you can uh seth how what the inception of Brian loves you like where did it come from because I'm listening to the commentary you're not a big whore fan dude uh (laughs) that's an interesting way to start uh interview about a horror movie and you're right I mean I would consider it more of a thriller or a a psychological thriller more so than horror horror is you know pop culture shorthand for things that are scary and and I do think it hopefully achieves the goal of of being scary and unnerving. And so basically the inception where it came from, I had made a comedy feature prior and uh, similar micro budget, similar scale. Um, And when I was ready to do another movie, the story I had in me at the time was scary, uh, taking from personal experience, growing up ostracized and as an outsider in rural Arizona, being of New York, let's say origins, um, well not, let's say that's the truth. Um, so the, the genesis of the story was there. It's just being a, a kind of like an outsider in a, in a foreign land, at, which is what Arizona was to me as a child. 
uh, and just going through the rigors of growing up and trying to make it in the world and fit in and be normal or whatever that is. And, um, and in my world, in my life, it was a scary experience. And so as a storyteller and filmmaker, I told um, a scary story. Um, and that's where, that's where it began. And that's I, why it happened. I, and I think you really achieve that. Like when I, cause so something you should know about me, Seth, I don't, I get all this stuff sent to me to, you know, by distributors to watch. And I, if I know about it beforehand, you know, whatever, like, I, I think I got American werewolf in London. Like, obviously I know about that, but I, Brian loves you had escaped me. I didn't, I don't watch trailers, Seth ever. I don't watch previews. If I'm in a theater, I will get the fuck up and walk out of the theater. If it's to a, like a trailer starts playing to a movie that I know I'm going to see, you don't have to twist my arm to see a Christopher Nolan movie or a Tom Hardy movie. I just go, Oh, Tom Hardy's a, I'm, I'm going to be back in about a minute and a half to sit down and watch this. Cause all I had to go on was the cover. And I believe there was uh, by one of your buddies, uh, something about clockwork orange on, right. on there. And yeah. I just kind of was like, all right, well, let's, let's, let's give it a whirl and see what I, I was uncomfortable. And basically from the time the guy standing outside your guys's house uh, in the film from then on. And even that, ex I think the execution in this, whether it be the editing, the pacing, I, I I'm, I'm really a nerd, but the sound design is really what hit for me. Like I, I thought, <laughs> Like when we needed to feel uncomfortable, when our heart needed to skip a beat, you achieve that every single time. And that's another one of your boys that was uh, doing the sound design for that, too. And mm -hmm. I, I got to tell you, from start to finish, I never got comfortable. And I think with when you're talking psychological thrillers, that is what you need to do at, at like from start to finish. And like like we were talking, the tonal shift, it 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 was something very real to you, right? Once we make it into the, the psychiatric hospital, this is, this is a relatively uh, real experience to you. And then the more I thought about it, uh, of what you said, I, I got mad and I know it's not your fault, but the other parties involved, I got mad <laughs> because I was just like, you, you gotta be kidding me. So I, if, if, if you don't mind it, can we talk a little bit about, I mean, cause that, that would be some of the inspiration for the film is, where we wind up and uh, and I, i'm grateful that you're comfortable to talk about it with i mean i'm in therapy and i don't know how much i would say other than the one thing i've learned ab about being in therapy uh which isn't the same as what <laughs> was going on in brian loves you it turns out i hate my father that's what i learned i i, I really hate my father so um yeah. let's talk about some of these experiences that you went through that, that we don't need to get too painful i don't want that but just how how we got there Right. And, and I, I think I'm good about talking about pretty much anything in my past. I think like most people, I had different times of tumult in my life, whether it was the death of a loved one or living under the roof of somebody who is either kind of like domineering or potentially abusive in different ways. I, I don't think I'm so unique in that respect. I, I think in my life, what happened to me, which I mean, I'm 45 now. And so uh, if I'm op open with somebody enough to tell them the story, uh, I, I, the consistent feedback I've heard is what that happened. So I, I think sometimes if you have something so outside of the norm, it might be interesting enough to put into a movie. So ba basically, um, I was trying to grow up and have a normal teenage life right around the time that I was beginning high school, things at home were pretty rough and my parental figure didn't feel like I was doing enough to, I guess, uh, be the kind of child that they expected of me. And so they essentially, on the advice of my therapist at the time, put me into an inpatient facility to kind of correct or fix me and make me the kind of like um, person child that they wanted me to be or that they thought I should be. And so the uh, experience of being put in there was fairly jarring in a sense where it was teased where if you don't shape up and do what we're expecting of you, um, you're going to go here. So you're going to come with me and you're going to see this facility and you, it's going to scare you straight. And I thought, man, I really don't want to do this, but I don't have many options. I, I think at this time in my life, when I was a child, 14, 15 years old, I, I didn't think I had the ability to say no to a parental figure or a guardian, I, I just knew and you know, the, the line is what, until you're the age of 18, you're under their control. And so you just have to go with it. So I went with it. 
And I went to this facility and after taking the tour, they brought me into a room very similar to my scene with Tiffany Shepis. And they sat me down uh, in the scene with Tiffany Shepis. There's no parental figure parent because I'm an adult in the story, but in real life, I'm a child. And they basically said, um, you're going to be staying here. And that to me was like just pulling the rug out from under me. I was totally shocked. And I think, um, you know, things like that that happen in your life where, you um, I don't know necessarily that I'd call it betrayal. I, I don't I don't really have anger at these things in my life anymore because I'm I've worked through it all and I, I see sometimes in life you're meant to go through certain situations that shape your perspective and and make you who you are. And uh, but but that experience of essentially being tricked into being admitted into an inpatient psychiatric facility was fairly hurtful. And so it took me a while to adjust to this where I was basically in a locked facility. I was not able to leave the ward because you're considered a flight risk when you're admitted as such. Uh, eventually, I kind of learned to, it's interesting as a child, you're kind of innocent and you're at the mercy of these adults who have more power and knowledge and influence than you. And so I internally in my mind, when they were processing me, they would ask me things like, do you have any scars and, and things that they would be able to like label me and kind of like you know, stamp me, this, this is ours right now. And if it should happen to escape, now we have the dirt on anything we might need to get him back. For example, the question about, do you have any scars or birthmarks? At the time I answered it honestly. And then when I replayed it in my head later that day, I thought maybe I shouldn't have been so forthcoming with that because why is it their business? But again, the innocent child doesn't know any better. You're asked a question, you honestly answer it. And so I think this experience for me was like, one of the first lessons in life where this is the world, you are a cog in the machine and you're going to play your part. And for me, that part was I was fodder for this hospital's profit machine. I was one of their customers and they don't care how I got in there. They just care that I'm in there and the insurance company is footing the bill. And, you know, that, and that was my experience, but, but back to how I internalized it, um, it kind of made me think, Everybody is going to have your best interests at heart and people might not treat you in the best way because they have ulterior motives, whether it's, let's say, a guardian or a parent wanting you to behave a certain way or the company itself, a hospital, wanting the profit off, it, off of you. Uh, you know, everybody kind of has their own motivation uh, and, and, and energy that guides them. And sometimes you're just like at that mercy. So um, the experience for me was was pretty scary because I didn't have control over my situation and I was forcibly admitted tricked into being a, you know, a, a, a patient. And something that happened to me though, was I learned to play the game. You learn to kind of start telling them what they want to hear. Uh, they wanted to hear that I was mad at a different parental figure uh, for all the things that they did to wrong me. When in reality, I, I didn't feel it. I mean, essentially the person who had admitted me, that's who I had more issues with, but the programming as I was admitted was this is Seth and this is what's wrong with him, fix him, then let him out, let him be at home and, and be the, the person that, that we want him to be. And so, uh, I kind of played along just to get along. And I remember asking my doctor, it doctor, uh, psychiatrist in there that was assigned to me, I, one of my first questions was, when can I get out of here? And his response verbatim was, that's exactly the attitude that will keep you in here, which is in the movie. Um, and it's such a frustrating experience to, to be in that. But if you're smart, what do you do? You adapt. So you learn to play their game. Okay, thinking to yourself, what answers do you want to hear? I don't want to be in here. I, I will say as an aside that the, the kids in the ward, because we were all, I believe, I must've been like 18 and under when we ranged from probably uh, early teens, 13 to 18 in there. I, I have to say that I made some, some friends and some bonds. And, and I think like any situation, like if you look at one flew over the cuckoo's nest in that movie, you know, people tend to band together when they're in those kinds of oppressive situations. And that's what happened to me. So I, I have to say that it was very scary at first, but I learned to adapt to my environment and I actually started to feel comfortable in a sense where my peers, we were all on the same page. I mean, we were still normal kids. Very few of us had like real psychological trauma, schizophrenia, a major addiction. For the most part, they were like me where they were going through some stuff and their guardians or parents said, put them in there, fix them. Um, and, and so it, it, in some ways it was almost like camp. 
it's just a very restrictive camp. And unfortunately, you have to be on a dosage of psychiatric medication in order to be a member of this camp. And if you don't take it orally, they will force it into you. So there, there were very scary elements, but you know, the human mind is very interesting. You, you know you're in the situation that you ostensibly shouldn't be in, but you're here and you have to make the best of it and you have to survive and cope. And so those are all skills that I learned at a fairly early age because of this experience. Well, and I, and I think it shows in the film uh, because of how realistic it is. Even, even your DP's choice, to, his choice in sh- shooting it how he did. Like the, the location that you, especially the scene you're talking about with uh, Tiffany, um, I, again, like I never got comfortable. And when you're having that conversation with her, like this dread this dread is in me. And I just like, there were points. I'm not going to lie to you, man. And it, it's nothing that, but that says that the film shit, I wanted it to end. Like I, I got to the point where it's like, after, I think it was uh, after you freaked out in the, uh, the, the, the meeting in the circle, I was just like, I can't group like, therapy. Yeah. yeah. This is, this is too much for me. Like that. I can't, was there a nurse ratchet? Did you have a nurse ratchet in your facility that you can point to? <laughs> I would say in my facility, there were like kind of more tough guy orderlies that would act as the enforcer if people got out of line. But for the most part, day to day, nobody that extreme. I I think they were all kind of like working their job and just wanting to get through the day. Um, I to me, the more um, um, I don't negative i don't want to say negative i don't want to say evil but to me the the scarier personas in that environment were more so the doctors who weren't there full time they would come in they would look at charts they would prescribe psychiatric medication then they would go and they didn't have to see that if the patient didn't want it then they'd be restrained they'd be put in a you know for lack of a better term straight jacket and injected with it so this doctor who doesn't really know you very well at all he's looking at he or she is looking at a chart and just your data, your, uh, your stock. And so they're looking at your numbers and they're thinking, well, let's adjust this and that. And to me, that is, those are the people I don't respect because you don't really know what you're doing to this person and you don't really care. It's a profit machine. And that's my personal experience. I can't speak for every patient and every doctor, obviously, but I felt mine was cold, unfeeling, didn't give a shit. And essentially, I was part of his job. Um, and that's my takeaway from my personal interactions. And that's what's in the movie. And that, I mean, the time that had, that, that happened, that had to have been late 80s, early 90s, I would assume that you were. Correct. You know, and there was a, I mean, even now, though, I go back and forth and we're not here to talk, you know, about about the health system per se or the healthcare system per se but i can tell you even though we've acknowledged it there's still very little shit given like i have a lot of friends that's just like i mean it's you know i go to therapy i do this like that and the other thing but there's this still this lack of care and i don't know again i don't i'm not saying that all doctors are bad or anything i maybe it's more of a lack of understanding um kind of exactly what you know, each individual person's going through, but I can't even imagine back then where, I mean, like you said, like, I'm sure a lot of those guys, guys, gals, I'm here to do a job and you are a number, you know, and in a lot of ways, I think we've acknowledged that now, but I I don't know how far we've progressed. So let's, let's not, let's not be a bummer. This show's not a bummer. Let's, (laughs) let's, let's, speaking of numbers, let's, let's dial it back a little bit. Speaking of numbers. So we we sh- you you shot on a very modest budget. I think I read maybe twenty five grand. Um, That's it. That in was it. Seventeen days. Um, yeah. Yeah. So approximately three weeks. Yeah. Can kind of describe because I I have a lot of aspiring filmmakers that listen to this show. Can you talk about that experience? Is was it a run and gun or did you? I mean, you being a reporter, I would assume you you probably went the distance with the pre prep, which is what I tell everybody that uh, that listens to the show. I mean, I it cannot be understated just how much pre prep can save you time, money at X Y Z, and I. Looking back on it, I mean, because I, I can't even imagine. I'm sure now you probably think, oh, my God, we could have done so much more things with different equipment now that we could have back then. But I don't know. I guess some of the um, anything that you look back on and you're like, man, that was tough to do. But if 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 I were to do it, I would still do it again the, the same way. 
Um, I, I think part of it is timing. We were all, uh, so as I mentioned, I'm 45 now. When I made the movie, I was about 30. Um, so I think part of it is timing. When, when you're in those younger years, when you're in your 20s and even 30s, I would say, people are more willing to kind of get on a project without the financial considerations that might be there later in life, because maybe now you have a spouse and kids and different things and you're closer to retirement. It's just part of that was timing. Could I do Brian Loves You today the way I did it? Absolutely not, because I would have to wait for more of a budget. In fact, I'm actually considering doing another one, but that will take budget and other things going on. But to the point of the original one, uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head where it is planning. So in lieu of money, you need time. You need one of the two. You need either all the money in the world and then fine, rush it, throw money at every problem and you'll be okay, I guess, as long as your script is tight and your cast knows what they're doing and it's edited properly. But um, in the absence of a large budget, you need a lot of time to plan and you have to be meticulous about everything. Which So here, here's a short little story. When I moved to... LA, one of my first friends who ended up becoming one of my best friends, who was a production guy, filmmaker, he went into producing and stuff. Um, he would always say, when you're in LA, know three ways to get to every destination whenever you leave the house or the apartment, whatever. Uh, meaning that something's going to probably go wrong, especially with LA traffic. And so if I'm going from the West side to Hollywood, I can either take Santa Monica all the way down. I can jump on the freeway. I can cut diagonally. So I think filmmaking is similar to that, where always have a backup plan and then a backup plan to your backup plan. Meaning when you're preparing, you can't just prepare for all the things you think you're going to need to do from start to finish. You need to have auxiliary plans for every single day and situation. Meaning what happens if the camera falls and breaks? Where are your backup houses? What happens if somebody hurts himself on set? Where are your hospitals or urgent care facilities? Um, what happens if the makeup person just doesn't show up or shows up without their kit. I mean, this is, it's almost paranoid, borderline paranoid, but this is how you have to think as a filmmaker. You can't just think, it. it's not just the script and the casting and the production and the editing and the marketing and the sales. And even that is a long shot for any given filmmaker because I know plenty who have, I just listed like six or seven things. I know plenty who have gone to three or four or five a few get to six and seven and their movies out there, which is like a miracle, but um, it, it, it's having, it's thinking about everything that can possibly go wrong. And then what are you going to do if that happens? And inevitably on Brian loves you and every other movie, I'm sure several things go wrong. In my first movie, the camera did fall. So we had a rush to get a backup because when you have a low budget sub 50, I, I was just going to say a hundred thousand dollar movie that we're talking sub $40,000 movies. Okay. So your camera is a key element of your production. What do you do? You have all these people and you have the locations. You can't just stop because your key piece of equipment went down. You better know where you're going to get that backup. Now, hopefully that doesn't happen. That's an extreme situation. And, and I, I will always take responsibility for any mistake. Um, like that should not have happened, but shit happens. So it's, it's planning and it's thinking of what are you going to do if this actor doesn't show up, if this piece of equipment breaks, if your location is locked and you can't get in? Do you have a location contact? Do you have a backup location contact? Do you have the proper permits? Um, and, you know, if you're on a street in front of a house that you're filming at, a neighbor might see you call the cops. And if you didn't get that city permit because you thought, oh, well, we're in a house and we're going to be on the property, we had that happen where a nosy neighbor was like home all day and peeking out of the curtain and they saw a film crew in 2004, my first movie, and the police rolled up. I went to my binder. I flipped through it. Here's the city of Tempe permit. Here you go. Oh, great. See ya. Again, planning and thinking of everything that can go wrong, short of like a comet hitting the earth. That's how you get it done, basically, I think, in, in, in micro budget land. Um, anything you look back on that kind of makes you cringe that you think like if I would have had a bigger budget, it I, I didn't see anything cringeworthy on this, but especially like with a found tons. Oh, tons. tons. Well, I know like yeah. I know uh, some of the some of I wouldn't say dismay, but like I know with the higher res that you're watching this on, you kind of like I definitely think this probably played a little bit better on a DVD. And I say that all the time. Like I, I tell my audience, like I love Evil Dead. I do not need to see a 4K 
restoration of Evil Dead. I just, I just don't like. In fact, I'll even take it a step further. Like, I'd rather watch Evil Dead or uh, Monster Squad or whatever the fuck on a VHS on a shitty TV because I, it kind of like this movie, like the power of illusion. You know, like it. Yeah, like, it's softer. Yeah. And and I don't know, is there anything that you look back on, maybe a scene in <laughs> specifically where you're just like, ah, oh, God damn it. I just I, that's hard to watch. Uh, so besides I, I, your besides your poofy I, hair, besides your hair that you that you uh, the commentary yeah, that, <laughs> that bothers me, man, it looks like a bird's nest. So I'm, I'm just like so sensitive to those aesthetics. Um, yeah, so I, I th- I'd say it's fair game if I talked about it in the commentary because I did have the ability to cut things out of that before I delivered it to MVD. But um, yeah, you know, as, as an, I, I'm not going to say things that I noticed because I don't want other people to notice it. And, and whenever you create something, you're going to see so many more things that other people don't. But to this day, I'll look at things that I've made and think, how did I not catch that in dailies, in post, it, with my editor, with my sound editor? Because typically, you know, you don't just get the... You have picture editing, then you have sound editing, then you have delivery. So you basically have three tries to catch things after your offset and after you've watched daily. So really, we're talking five or six passes at this thing. And if it makes it into the final cut that's on the movie, you just sit back incredulous thinking like, how? But what happens is, um, you know, sometimes when you're doing anything, you have to look away and then look back. And sometimes when we don't do that things can fall through the cracks. So are there things in the thing in, in the content that I've made that I would change? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I, I think um, everyone um, uh, it's incidentally, I'm all good on time. So okay. um, I, I, I think everybody in their own way that creates something will find a million little problems in it. But what you have to do is be meticulous in your preparation, in your production, in your post-production and if something makes it into the cut that you didn't intend the odds are people will either a not notice it or b they will think it's intentional they don't know um so yeah to your original question there are a lot of things in anything i've ever done that bothers me because you always think you could do it better but that's what happens the next thing you make you use that experience and you make sure either like lighting, sound, picture, blocking, scene direction is different. And that's just the journey of, of any, you know, professional in, in, in any uh, vocation, I, I would think. Um, but n- nothing that I'm really cringing about, but tons of things that I would just do differently. Um, so with the, like, we're talking about this, you know, we're talking to the audience, you know, a lot of these aspiring filmmakers, we're talking about this low budget and everything. And yet somehow you got some heavy hitters to come on board for this film. You got George went, you got, I mean, Tony Todd sets the tone for this film right from the jump. And and I mean, I only say this because I'm a toxic fanboy myself, not as toxic (laughs) as the horror fans, but like I'm the type of person that like, I I know, I I think you're a sports fan, right? Cards, bro. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) So I, I, I'm one of those people, like, I just want to, I want you to keep playing for, you know, until you, you're so broken down that like, you know, everything hurts and everything, but that's, I, I kind of felt that way about Tony Todd. Now I'm not the type of fan that's oh, what, where did he go? Why didn't he come back and all that other horse shit? But like, mm. I, I'm sitting there and going, I mean, obviously he has, you know, a, a, a voice of the gods, but like mm. the tone that he sets really early on is second to none and we're talking about this small budget but like you got i mean i i i don't refer to george went as norm from cheers i he's the guy from house to me and right like, and he's he's sam from from fletch to me yeah i totally hear you like and i just why i just want to say it just because i don't give a shit about my audience house is one of the best movies ever i love fred decker and just house 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 if you haven't seen it no i'm not talking about the tv show but if you haven't seen it you need to check it out because it's awesome and by the way george went who's in brian loves you also in house so make sure you check that it's out quite but, funny very <laughs> funny in it how did you get these people to come aboard with such a small budget so uh, I think the short answer to that is um, a few points. Um, have a little bit of a name, be, be around, do some things, be a professional, be nice, uh, and, and have something to offer them. Meaning if you're an actor, they probably want a role that they enjoy and they want a project that they can believe in. 
Um, and, and that's the short answer, but, you know, getting a little bit more granular, um, I started, I went, I moved to LA in 2000 to be an actor and that led to sketch and that led to stand up comedy. So I was around different circles of people. And along the way, I met some good friends that to this day, they'll, they're some of my best friends and they'll probably be until the day that I die. Um, one of those friends from an old sketch show happened to be in a lot of like horror sci-fi circles. My good friend, um, Dan Schweiger, who was a guest in the interview with Dan Roebuck. And you can kind of see the dynamic of our relationship there. And that's very true to life. I mean, I love the guy and he's like, what I, I had a comparison. I I'm spacing on it now, but he's like, Woody Allen crossed with, I can't think of it, but um, so, so Dan, uh, through Dan, I met several different people in the horror sci-fi world, including Daniel Roebuck, who I saw at things like uh, a wedding or a party, and you kind of see people and you talk to them, and this is the benefit of living in Los Angeles. I think now, these days, you could be a content creator on YouTube or other platforms and establish your name and then fly people in, and it's a lot easier to do movies from anywhere. But back in the day, before YouTube was what it is today or whatever platform you prefer, you kind of had to be in either L.A. or New York more so. And so when I was coming up and it was harder to make a movie and equipment wasn't like your phone, you had to actually rent a camera from the house. It was more of the, that handshake environment where, oh, I saw you around. I remember you from this thing. I remember at the aforementioned Dan Schweiger's birthday party at the corner of Melrose and Robertson or one of these hip places. And Schweiger is like a foodie. So he loves going to all the new restaurants. Um, and I was sit seated next to Stuart Gordon. And that's the first time I had ever met Stuart. Um, so over time, I'd see Stuart at different things. And Stuart was very good friends with George Went. They're both from Chicago and the theater scene, and they're just very both in, in, intelligent individuals who kind of appreciate something that you can think about. And so basically, uh, when I made my first movie, I went to George the first time. Uh, this is a comedy called Takeout that actually MBD has also released, but um, he passed because of his schedule. And then when Brian came about, I went back to him. I cleared it with Stuart first, of course, uh, and he said, sure, I'll do it. And so kind of that that's how it works. Uh, Tiffany is an interesting story. Um, she and I were both actors on the movie Ted Bundy done by Matthew Bright, who was most famous for Freeway. And Matthew Bright's mentor, if I'm recalling correctly, was Oliver Stone. I mean, this guy had a really good pedigree. And then he got shit all over for his movie Tiptoes, which, you know, in this day, and it, which is about, are you familiar? familiar. Um, so it, it, the, this is, a, you. I think you and I probably have similar ideas when it comes to like critic and the mob mentality where certain people just jump on a project and they won't relent. And it's like, okay, step back. This is actually a really good piece of cinema and it may offend some circles, but if you, you know, the people behind it were genuine. This, and I'm talking specifically about Tiptoes, and I, I've seen multiple reviews saying, oh, this is awful. How could this be made? What were they thinking? Well, four or five really big actors committed to it, and they spent months on set with this director, so obviously there was something there. It's real easy after the fact to say, I can't believe I did that. Well, you did it, and you were intentional, and so clearly there was more validity there that like the mob, the internet mob is, is giving it, but uh, not, not to get too sidetracked, but things like that always bother me because it's like there are a lot of I'm not saying this is necessarily a great movie but I'm saying in general there there's really good solid art out there that says something that just is popular to shit on it and people see somebody else maligning it and so they jump on the pile and it just becomes like that almost like a family guy scene where the all the football players are tackling and it becomes comically high so um so basically back to the point on Matthew Bright's film Ted Bundy which, I mean, it, very grisly and macabre subject matter, no doubt, but it, a well done story because he was a really good storyteller. And now I think he's like way off the grid and out of the country and just doing his own stuff somewhere in the jungle of South America or something, somewhere uh, not here. But at the time, um, he was on the ascent and he had like some credibility in independent film circles. So I saw Tiffany on set. When I was on set, I was just on set for one day. I had a tiny part. Tiffany had a larger part, but we crossed paths. She did not know who I was. I'm sure she didn't even think of me at all. But then fast forward a few years later, and we're adjacent in a cafe in Sherman Oaks. And I turn over and I said, hey, 
and I, I said who I was. I, I just told uh, her what I told you, minus the tiptoes part, because it was before tiptoes. But uh, no, I'm sorry, it was after tiptoes, but I didn't mention that. Um, and uh, that's how we met. Uh, so again, it, it's just like, you know, in, in the absence of big budgets, you just have to be around and know some people and have some talent to be able to say, here's a script I wrote. Uh, I'm going to be shooting on this date. Are you available? And, and that's also the thing. Wrangle the money so you have a start date to tell them. Because I, I have many friends that I've been working for years in development with that always have multiple projects, good scripts, and these people attached, but they're waiting for the financing. And then that's that whole like kind of like snake eating its own tail game that just can, uh, it can just be an indefinite situation. Um, so having a decent script, having a money and a start date and being around. And if you're just like a professional and you know how to talk to people and it, you treat it like a business, uh, there are several artists that I know that are just like, they're out there, man. They're either musicians or filmmakers or actors. And it's like, you can't even talk to them because they're on another planet. And it's like, like I, I treat this professionally. I consider myself a professional. I, I like my sets to be safe and fun and like a good place of business where people feel comfortable, even if the content and, and the emotions are uncomfortable. It's like, you have to know it's like, it's made up. There, there is a start and an end. I guess I'm not really a method guy. You can probably tell from this. Like I can turn it on and off. If I need to be angry, I could be angry. But then I don't have to be angry when somebody says cut because it was a movie and it, we're playing. So I, I think people can kind of like respect that. It's like, like any job, be professional, make somebody feel good, pay them what you can. If, if it's, you know, pay them what you can in your own world. Obviously in a micro budget, I, I can say like, here's the whole budget for the movie. This is what I can give you. I apologize. It's not what you normally get, but please consider it. And you can't expect anything. You can't say like, oh, well, are you too good for it? It's just, it's attitude. Just be cool and have like a good place of work, of employment. Oh, man, your attention to detail and your memory, I swear to like, I even like when you were talking on the, co right there and when you were talking on the commentary, I'm like, Jesus Christ, like, I, I don't know if I smoked half my brain away. I don't know <laughs> what the fuck, but like your attention to detail is second to nuts. But I do want to walk it back a little bit talking about the mob mentality and they kind of, the, yeah, they kind of came for oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they kind of came for you on this film. And when I heard you talk about it, like, again, I twice, you know, or well, actually, I watched this film three times. Um, but the, on the second time, I'm sitting there. Now I'm getting uncomfortable and upset about something completely. I've talked about it on my show uh, almost at nauseum. But the idea that because you had these heavy hitters stepping on set with you, the expectation of either blood, gore, tits, whatever. And they came for you because of, well, I mean, let's, let's just talk about a little bit of it is that the critics really hit you hard, which I don't, I would be interested to see if a lot of those critics, whoever they may be, because I, I don't know, I didn't feel like going down the rabbit hole and getting more upset myself, but I would be interested to see how they felt about this film now, as opposed to when they watch it. But let's mm -hmm. talk about the mob coming for you, though. <laughs> uh, I, so I remember when we were in when we were in prep, we got a lot of good press, which I really appreciated from all the then heavy hitters. And, you know, media changes. It, it's a ever evolving animal. And back in the day, I mean, who were the big players? Fangoria was like the top, you know, bloody disgusting, Grand Central, all, all the main people. Um, uh, some of them are still around today and some of them are new, uh, different people, uh, different uh, platforms. I remember in particular, Fangoria did a bunch of stuff on us. The movie came out, the reviewer absolutely savaged it, hated it. And, and again, gore is in their name, kind of predictable. Um, I, I can't fault them for that, um, but I remember in particular sending their office back then they had an office in New York uh, flowers with a note that basically said, you know, thank you for the wonderful review. We love you guys or something like that. I, I wasted like $100 on that, like on that backhanded compliment, like F you joke, because I guess it made myself feel better. If would I do that again today? No. I put that in an account. I put it to a new project. I wouldn't waste it to like show them who is the big man. But 
Uh, I didn't do a lot of that. In fact, I, what I learned from that experience was never look at reviews and I won't. I mean, there are rare exceptions where if somebody that I know says, oh, hey, check this out, sure. But when I was younger and when I had my first movie came out, I think I read all of them, which is not good. And if you have a filmmaking audience, here's what I would tell them. Do not read reviews ever because you're going to get great ones and it makes you feel really great. But then you're going to get bad ones and then it's going to make you feel really bad. And why are you putting yourself at the mercy of somebody who's sitting back and criticizing other shit? So it, it I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily think that anybody doesn't have a right to their own free speech and say what they want but it got to a point where and and i i know that now that it's released it's probably the same thing there's a mix there are some people who really like it and there are some people who really hate it it's the worst thing in the world don't uh, so it it's always been mixed i'm actually used to that um i i'm comfortable with it but the thing is okay you think about it logically, take yourself out of Hollywood and the bubble and the magic. Okay. We're all in business. We're all trying to have a career. We're all trying to make money. We're all trying to have a good life. We're all trying to be happy. So take all the like smoke and mirror shit away from it for a second. So your business is you want to be known as a critic and you are repeatedly telling people not to watch this other movie that somebody worked really hard on that dozens, if not hundreds of people worked really hard on. And some people like it. You might not like it, which is fine. But some people like it. But you are doing your damnedest to send out multiple social media posts and say, like, don't watch this. I don't understand what your business is. Do you think that people are going to want to give you money for saving them time for avoiding something? Because you know, you know for a fact that you're that this person that you have no idea who they are will not like this piece of art. It it just doesn't make sense to me. And so like I, I'm at a point in age now where I have empathy for people. Like I I think everybody's trying to find their groove and to to be known for something and to be happy. And part of me, yeah, if I ever even like catch a glimpse of something online where I can tell it's a bad review, because you can tell. Like if you've been in the game long enough, you can look at either like a photo or a headline or if the screen cap has somebody looking at your movie like this. Mm, then you know it's probably a bad review. It's not. It's not hard to tell. And for the audio, uh, for the audio listeners out there, I made like a very uh, discouraging and like disgusted face. Um, and I actually did catch that like once. And like again, I make it a point. You get so good at scanning things where you know to avert your eyes. Much like a lot of the mainstream news cycle. Like I won't even look at what they're trying to put in front of me. Like I don't care. I don't care what you're trying to push to the masses today. I don't need to be living in fear. And so like, like I've gotten really good at scanning things on a screen to avoid things that I know are going to not make me feel good. Um, obviously, if there's information I need to know, I will consume it. But most of the shit out there is garbage. And that's just the business model. They are in the business. And I'm talking about people who push out stuff just to get eyeballs with very little validity or purpose behind it because they're clicks are their currency. And so I, I get why they do what they have to do. And now we're coming back to the reviewers. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the horror, die hard horror, I wanna see brains split open and I wanna eat somebody's intestines. And if you don't have a monster or a wizard or an explosion, or if you don't saw off somebody's hand, your content is shit. So you have to understand where they're coming from. And so I, I think you can say that. I'm all for free speech. I'm all for expressing yourself. But it gets to the point where it's like, sometimes you see people going a little bit overboard in, with it. It's like, give it up. Okay, you didn't like it, you reviewed it, let it go. And occasionally you'll see these people who keep posting like warnings, avoid. And it's like, what? My question to them would be, I would love to talk to them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to talk to them about what, why they didn't like what I made because I, I don't care. If somebody loves it, awesome. If they don't, okay, that's the risk you take putting anything out there. But I would just love to ask them from like a business standpoint. So you're okay with trying to take food off of somebody else's table because you're not just saying that this thing isn't for me and here's my problems with it. You're just throwing out superlatives and just like hyperbole and you're telling people don't watch it. So you're telling people don't visit this business. And you're okay with that because you probably think you're doing a public service, but you're trying to kill somebody's business. So I don't, uh, as, as an adult, 
This is how I look at it. As a young person and a young content creator, artist, filmmaker, you probably take it personal. Oh, well, F them, man. And like, you know, I'm, I, I get that because we're all at different stages in our lives. But as an adult with responsibilities and just trying to live a good life and wanting the same for other people, it's like, like you don't know what you're doing. Like you think you're being snarky and you think you're being funny, but you're not considering the ramifications of what you're saying. You don't realize that your voice as ludicrous as it may be, may be discouraging certain people from visiting a business. And you're not qualified to say that because this person that you're talking to, which is the heir on social media, you don't know who you're reaching. I mean, you might know your most diehard fans, those like few hundred or thousand people that, that often engage with your posts, but you really don't know who you're talking to. So you, as somebody with a beard in a basement, can't tell the world oh, don't look at this. It's not for you. Well, you don't even know who you is. So it's just like, as an adult looking at that, you just shake your head and go, you know what? <laughs> you, you, you can't pay attention to it. It's not worth it. Dude, you made me laugh out loud when uh, you mentioned uh, you're like, somebody had said this is the worst movie i've ever seen and you're like have you seen movies before like how many movies have you actually seen every movie to make, the, <laughs> to make this statement dude <laughs> i was dying laughing because i was like oh my god he's a hundred percent right like where we just do that now like we just like if gang we, tackle yeah, yeah, yeah. And dude i was just rolling laughing because like it, i mean honestly even with this podcast like there was one rule i mean and sometimes you know i, mean, I may lose sight sometimes but i always follow it up with a positive but the main thing or not main thing but one of the reasons i started the podcast is because i thought there was too much negativity on the internet and i thought mm -hmm. that it would be and you know a, a crusader a, an internet crusader i'm failing at but the point was <laughs> is like just like if you talk about these things in 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 a positive light or like even like like you were saying like if there's something that you personally like you're not trying to tear down the people that made it where you were just like, oh, well, that didn't fit for me or that didn't work for me. I and nowadays it doesn't ever come from a place of knowledge like it always comes from a place of emotion whereas I like to think at least on this show if I go and I say something that I didn't like I have three examples or three three facts like for me of why it didn't play well for me and I and I always follow it with but somebody else may have you know loved that you know uh particular scene or whatever it was but man yeah. you are a hundred percent right like it it's just it's 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 vicious out there and it's so funny like again we were talking before we rolled like for someone who like i kind of like try to stay away from all this and yet somehow mm. i'm a part of it what started out as a joke now has the whole world laughing that sort of shit i I, I just it's weird to be a part of it. It really is weird to be a part of it because like, I, I I feel the same. Yeah, I do not consider myself a critic at all. I, I, I consider myself a guy who loves movies so much. Like, why doesn't he talk about their talk to the people that made him? Because he fucking he's he's obsessed with movies. That's all it is. It's not a, it's not to prove anything you know, like like, uh, by the way, my point of view is so much better than you. It's, it was never about that. So I it, it was refreshing to hear someone echo the same sentiments, like especially like what you're talking, like the business standpoint, the ramifications. That's what it some is. Of, some of the shit that you're saying in in yeah. rent or whatever so um okay let's 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 walk it back a little bit let's walk it back into the movie a little bit so there's a couple things online we're jumping around this this is what i do this is what i this do fine. We're, we're, we're jumping around hang. there's there's uh there's some and I, I i never trust any of the shit that i believe on the internet but there's some stuff on the internet <laughs> that says that uh this was rooted in truth and i and i hope that it, we didn't already touch on it was there really a cult of brian that existed in arizona with a king and a queen or was that <laughs> was that like a was that kind of like a blair witch kind of ruse for the masses all right so i'm going to preface this answer with something where people are so certain that if it comes from a studio it's true and and i, I will say this that most movies that come out of hollywood are pretty much a glorified kind of propagandized form of bullshit it's it's usually made to make somebody look good and somebody else look bad and people who so 
you know, every movie has its own take on reality and, and mine is no different than others where uh, I, I just wanted to lump mine in with the rest of the content coming out of the dream factory that very rarely isn't accurate. I don't care if you're making a biopic on whomever, there are creative liberties taken and the odds are that the truth in that movie is a low percentage compared to the entertainment value. So um, re regarding Brian loves you, like kind of like your, your instinct is correct. It's, it's a mix. It's a combination of me being a reporter in the media and seeing stories here and there about different people taking advantage of other people in different ways and combining that with my personal experience, setting it in the early 90s, partially because it obscures what it really could be. I didn't want somebody to dig and say, okay, well, which cult was this? That is not the point. The point is that it's dangerous to think what your leaders are telling you simply because for whatever reason, they're in a position of leadership and you blindly follow and they cultivate this homogenous thinking that is detrimental to a free society. So that is the point. And sometimes when people drill down too much and say, aha, see, there was nothing in 1993 in this town. Well, the town was never named. And like, like you're, you're, you're focusing on the wrong thing. It's like you're, the point is what I just said. And as far as the elements of truth, yeah, it's picked from here and there and there. Think of it like a mighty apple tree and you're picking apples. It comes from different branches, but it's essentially from the same tree, which is life. That got super Buddhist, but uh, unintentionally so. All right, we can strike the next question where if there is any pushback in the community for your telling of a cult tale, we can stay away from that. So, well, I do have a good, I have do a good quick story about that. Yeah, let's do it. So this just comes from my belief that you know you just need to get press in lieu of big budget and big advertising. So basically, what happened was uh, on set in Phoenix during production in 2006, there was a mishap where the local newspaper wrote um, that we were going to be shooting a scene at a church uh, that was doubling for the house of worship for the Bryans, and the production is looking for extras. And here is the producer, not me, a, a different producer. The producer is like phone and email, uh, go contact him. Well, that's a no-no because we asked them not to say when and where we were shooting because, you know, when you're on a low budget set, you don't need any additional complications. Not that ever, anybody really gave a shit what we were doing, but just in case there was somebody local who either didn't like what we were portraying or wanted to be involved, but we couldn't facilitate that. Just We, we just don't need complications. We don't need additional traffic. And so it was an honest mistake from the reporter. And again, this is before the days where everything's on a tablet or a phone or electronic. It's more like hard copy paper, meaning when that story goes to print, it's out there. And there is there was an online element even back then, it just wasn't the same. So more people did give more credence to the hard copy paper. So basically that happened. I was a little bit upset because I just didn't need this trouble. But again, if you have filmmakers listening, this is one of the many things that will go wrong when you're on production, not only internal, but external. Something's going to happen external that's going to throw a wrench into your machine and you just have to deal with it. So what I did was I got on the horn, I called the reporter, I said, um, please issue like a retraction online at least and say, they're, they're, don't just come down. Don't contact this person. They're all good. Uh, I think I had told a local business person, yeah, if you know a few more people who can fill out the space, have them come down. And somehow that got to the reporter and he or she just threw it in the story. Honest mistake. But here's what I did. So I turned around and I flipped that and I said, well, obviously the community doesn't want this movie to be made because at a governmental and media level, they are trying to sabotage our production and I flipped that and the New York Post ran an item about that in page six but they misspelled Brian loves you they, they spelled it Byron loves you so it didn't quite have the same effect but um but these are the things that you can do in movies because it's all an illusion it's all the dream factory if you take it too seriously that's at your own peril I mean if something is on a screen you have to look at it with a very discerning eye and you have to understand what it is trying to do. If it's in one of these cases that house movies, it's supposed to entertain you. And also like, you know, inform in its own way, but you can't look at a piece of electronic media and say, aha, this is history. Like in Galaxy Quest, when they looked at the historical documents and they thought a TV show was reality, very similar. I mean, think about it that way. If you were an alien from another planet and you looked at the historical documents, that's an error. I mean, like, don't do that. I mean, you need to, 
get your knowledge from multiple sources in both books and personal interviews and just different things. You can't look at one thing and think this is truth. And that's kind of like the whole point of the movie is that there's not one source like the Brian's for your truth. You have to have like a more worldly mind where even if you're rooted in one physical location, you're looking at different sources of input and then deduce yourself, okay, what is truth and reality? And unfortunately in our world, we have a very, uh, uh, we have a great lack of that. So that kind of came full circle. Yeah. When I saw it, I was like, I, cause I, I don't know. I'm into, the, I'm into the, the, all the weird shit, the true crime, the cults and everything. I was like, I've never really heard of the followers of Brian before, but you know what? I'll just fucking ask him and see what he, see what he says. And we'll see how it turns out. Brian, Brian was chosen because it was kind of just like, um, like a common name that could be anything. Uh, and there were influences of my experiences with mainstream religion and items in the news. And I mean, I, growing up, uh, I'm not, I'm, I would say I'm spiritual, I'm not religious, which is like very common to hear people say these days, but I've always felt that way. I, I, I think essentially, and I hope this is not sacrilege to say, but I think essentially all religions are the same. I, I think they're trying to say the same thing, do the same thing. I think all gods are the same. Again, I hope that's not sacrilege, but my, my point is I respect them all in what they're trying to do as long as they're promoting, you know, like be a good person, help other people. Like it, as long as something is all about that, I'm all good with it. And so um, but not everybody thinks like me. And so growing up in Arizona, oh, no, being, I think I'm a, I'm in a goddamn simulation. That's, that's what <laughs> yeah. I, I, I did. Like, none of this is real. Yeah. This can't be real. This I can't be yeah. talking to a dude that just entertained me for probably a total of six hours and told this can't be real to me. So there is no God. Something's plugged into the back <laughs> of my fucking neck. Yeah. And yeah. this is just a wild fucking experience. But yeah. no, no, the matrix. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I would, to be honest with you, if that, if, if that were to become a thing one day, I'm out. I'm, I'm I don't want to I, I, I don't want to partake in most of this anymore, but <laughs> it's just yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, not that I don't want to be a bummer. So let's uh, walk it back a little bit into the whole cult feel the masks. Where were where did the idea come from the map? And I just wanted to say I noticed on your YouTube channel that you were doing a giveaway and I got so mm. fucking pissed that I didn't partake in the mask. It's mask. ongoing. So I did a bad I did a bad job marketing that that is that is live until uh, December. Oh, well, then well, then I'm partaking. I'm doing whatever I whatever yeah, any, I do. anybody is welcome to do it. <laughs> Perfect. So where did the mask come from? Because when I first saw it, because um, I'm I'm. Uh, I'm pro science, uh, pro choice, and also pro wrestling. So I thought Sting. <laughs> I thought Sting the first time I saw it. Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge WWF fan, and I was even into it through college in the '90s when WCW was the jam. Uh, I kind of got out of it by the time it became WWE, but like huge wrestling fan. I mean, to this day, I will drop, and that's the bottom line because Stone Cold said so into videos. In fact, the last video I uploaded to YouTube, that's the end of it. But uh, so the mask, uh, I was afraid of, I'm, I'm a weird person. So as a kid, I had weird fears. I was afraid of ET, ET scared the shit out of me. Uh, I just like, I, I know it's supposed to be a friendly alien, but it looks and sounds scary. So he runs into the fucking closet. It's, it's unnerving when he runs with his yeah. arms up in the closet. It's unnerving. Oh, yeah. as shit. It's unnerving. Right. As shit. It's a scary visual. And then it has that voice. How is this a friendly voice? This is never a friendly voice. And so like, I, I was afraid of that. I was afraid of masks. I was afraid of rubber masks in particular. And so Halloween was like a very traumatic time for me because if there was a rubber mask, I was afraid of it. And so that's part of where the idea of the masks came from. And also just the, the idea that it, it, it masks uh, human emotion. And so essentially the absence of uh human qualities to me is further scary so i basically took a childhood fear of masks and a, an adulthood fear of people without emotion and kind of combine them because when you obscure your face and your facial expressions that to a person with a soul is scary so um part of the uh makeup and demeanor of this cult is that they're emotionless you don't quite understand what their motivations are or why they're doing what they're doing, which again, further scary to me, much like Alice in Wonderland was always horribly, like very, very scary to me. E.T., e. Alice in Wonderland, certain things were 
extremely uh, unnerving and, and frightening to me because of the fact they're in a crazy world where nothing makes sense and you're seeing it through the eyes of a central character who's probably grounded in reality and represents you, the viewer. You're a normal, let's say, person in a crazy environment and you don't know what side is up or down. And so with Brian Loves You, part of the... Um, the representation of that is the mask uh, taking away human emotion and instilling more of a uniform blank look. And that was also developed with Jason Kisvarde, who now is a superstar production designer, but Brian Loves You was his very first production designer credit. I, I think they work in the way that your DP utilizes um, a lot of the shots with them. Perfect. For, especially for a found footage. Uh, speaking of your DP, you wanted more of a modern feel to this. And he kind of wanted more of a traditional old school um, yeah. approach to this. Right. And I, yeah. and I, I mean, I'm not going to say I, I, I didn't get a chance to see your vision initially, but the way that it plays now, I'm sorry, I'm watching it for a fourth time now over in the background. But um, <laughs> it's on a loop, like in the corner. It, yeah, and I, I, I just think it works in every facet. Whether it's even the the setting the camera up when George Went enters the 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 picture, or I, 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 I don't know. I guess I kind of wanted to talk about that as far as like what you had in mind in terms of well, this is how we're going to make it modern. When I think with a found footage piece. I, I, I like the execution here. I, I, well, I actually more than like the execution here. There's something even a very unnerving at, atmospheric about it that I think it played well for me. I mean, obviously, you know, some of the critics may have hated it, but I thought it was a great approach. Um, I, I think part of that is just, that's what happens on a film where it's a collaborative medium and there's no, I mean, I guess on some sets, it's not like that. It, it might be uh, more of a dictatorship, but on mine, I always thought that you have to bring in people who know what you're, they're doing. And as the director slash producer, you just aggregate the best ideas and you, and you just use your best judgment. So, um, and that's the way it goes. I mean, you have people who do uh, set decoration props, uh, costumes, camera, sound design. So you typically, and again, I'm speaking to this because you had mentioned that a large, or some of your audience is uh, either filmmakers or aspiring filmmakers or young filmmakers, I guess. Um, but it, it is a collaborative medium. And I mean, everybody has an ego and everybody wants to stand out in front in their own way, even if it's like kind of to the side, but essentially everybody wants to be recognized. Um, so my, my idea was shoot it more conventionally because you can easier, easier to scare people when you can put the camera whenever you want or wherever you want. So you put the camera right here and then somebody goes, Bleh! that's, that's easier than if the camera is way back in the corner and then the subject matter is here. So, um, that's what you have to kind of come to grips with when you're shooting in a dedicated style. So hours to serve the story was found footage because this is supposed to be things that really happen, um, cold together and cut by some government, uh, crudely cut by some governmental entity, let's say, for a historical record. And so so Jason Crothers was our uh, DP and he did a really great job, probably better than I deserved. And he was the one who, and, and I should say as an aside, he's been extremely supportive of the project and he's always talked it up. Um, so I appreciate that from him. Uh, in, in particular, like even his reps have told him like, yeah, people to this day ask us about your work on Brian Loves You. So, you know, thank you, Jason, for that. But he was more of the kind of I'm a film school guy. And if this is a found footage movie, we have to shoot it in a found footage style. I am not a film school guy. I just kind of like loved movies and I had different experiences in media. So together, our sensibilities came to that conclusion where we did more traditional found footage style where we cheated it at other points. For example, in the classroom scene, where the teacher sets up the camera closer to her than it would normally be in like a security camera vantage point. That's the middle ground you have to find in order to make it more interesting because if the entire movie is like Soderbergh-ish where it's like all concept and every camera is in an upper corner looking down, like I, I to me, that doesn't work. I don't want that. So we had a compromise and, and that's that's how we did that. Well, I wanted to say two two shots in particular that were my favorite of the film. Well, one was yours, where we have a 
camcorder on camcorder. I really love that. Yeah. But also, Meta. yeah, yeah. But I also loved when you let the camera sit for about two minutes. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm one of those people, man. Like the, the waiting for the dread, you know, like I, like I, the whole time too, like I never got comfortable as I was sitting there watching. It. And even a couple of times I'm like, is the goddamn disc working? Right? <laughs> like, what the fuck? You know, did, did, did something happen? And hashtag I, modern but, problems. <laughs> but I love that. Like I, I thought that that was again, one of the more effective uh, scenes mm. in the piece. And, and obviously for those of you that have seen it, there's nothing going on there. I mean, I mean <laughs> there's, there's, it's just, you know, but it's I, again, like I am so much more of a less is more, not that I don't love blood guts and everything else, but, but mm-hmm. I don't know. I think I've seen enough film that I can recognize what a film is trying to do. And in that moment, I was like, this is fucking great, dude. This is this, this, I wish more films would do that. Just one shot let it ride let let you get uncomfortable for a little bit i like that whereas now everything's smash cuts and you know quick edits of this that, and, and you shaky know, cam yeah and and here's the thing that's fine depending the piece i'm not here to shit on anyone but sometimes it would behoove you to just let it roll man just and and i definitely remember thinking like uh, i it's been a while since I've seen something like that where we just yeah. let it sit. And I, and I, I liked it, man. So kudos to you and your DP. Um, I appreciate um, that. I just want to say like, like a couple of things about that real quick is that um, I, I think I was the only person who really wanted that because I was like letting that Vincent Gallo ish filmmaker come out in me, like the, you know, arty guy, but like the, the idea with that was okay. This is like really, a found footage movie, then it's conceivable that somebody holding a camcorder puts it down, forgets it's on, leaves, and then in real time, you see somebody break in because that is showing you that the the like the like the grip on this town is that severe, that within moments of stepping away from your environment, somebody else may invade it. So something that my editor said while we were in the editing room, and I said, he actually talked me down. I think that shot was longer in the final cut, whatever it is, is. And he said, people are going to walk out of the movie thinking it was going to play in theaters or whatever, but I'll never forget that, that he said to me, people are going to walk out of this movie if you leave that shot in there. And I, and, and as a young filmmaker, I did compromise in a lot of different ways, but that shot, I did not compromise on. I said, no, it, it has to be there for the reasons that I just explained. So, but I appreciate that you saw that and you liked it. Dude, I, I, again, like I, I literally thought the fucking disc broke because like sometimes <laughs> I'll get this, some of this stuff from like Arrow or whoever, and there are problems. I, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but I don't give a shit. Like there are problems with the disc sometimes like, like where I, I, I'm not going to mention the movie, but we'll just say that the, there was two cuts of the movie, the international cut, the audio drops with about seven minutes left in the film. And, mm-hmm. and I'm just sitting there going like, wait, what? And like, obviously I, I go and I watch the, the U S cut or whatever it was and everything's fine. And I was just like, Oh, you know, that's but, frustrating. Yeah. Getting your technical, you know, ducks in a row is so imperative in film. And and I've, I've dealt with different technical challenges over the years, especially in low budget filmmaking, but like you're right. That nothing bothers me more than when things don't appear the way they should. So, so I wanted to wind it down here a little bit because I, I, you've been so great that thank you so much for staying as long as you have this. No, of course, I, I would, sure. I would love to continue to go honestly, but for, for the audience, I, I, I actually, as I, as I consider the audience, I'm not going to consider the audience for what I'm about to ask you. So Bobby Slayton was in this. I, yeah. you, you, I mean, for those of you that don't know Bobby Slayton, just give it a goog and check it out. But I, <laughs> I just, I just wanted to ask you a question because I'm a huge stand up comedian fan. Like, you, and in fact, mm-hmm. you could even make the argument that I'm a little pretentious when it comes to stand. I don't mean to be, but like, I, I, you being a stand-up comedian fan, I would I would say mm-hmm. that we could agree that there is a difference between West Coast comedy and East Coast comedy, right? So yeah, I, yeah. I I would I was curious some of your favorite comedians because you 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 did stand up and mm-hmm. I I just wanted to know I mean you get Bobby Slayton in this film over breakfast you just buy him breakfast and the motherfucker's like yeah yeah I'll do the fucking film yeah, I guess got to be in your movie now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay school <laughs> yeah so I just just for just me personal I just wanted to know some of your favorite comedians dude oh man I mean like that's like 
talking sports or something with me. Um, yeah. Okay, so here we go. Uh, All time favorite is probably Dave Attell. Um, and, and God awesome. knows that when I was doing my sets around LA, a few people said he's just trying to rip off David Tell, which I was not trying to rip off David Tell. But when you're a big fan of somebody, sometimes when you talk, the intonation is going to come out like that. Da, 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 and that's like David Tell. And so sometimes when I tell my jokes, I would, you know, it would, it would come out like David Tell. So I never ripped off. I mean, I have too much integrity as a human being to steal. So I would never a journalist, rip off. A journalist would never do that. <laughs> yeah all journalists are 100 percent ethical um i actually was but you know it's amazing when i was a journalist i had stories killed because the editor said oh the so-and-so called and they said the spike it meaning like the the person in of power that didn't want this truth to get out killed it because oh it happened several times i mean that's that's the way the media works the media is a business make no mistake about it but that is to the side as far as stand-up comedians um yeah i mean i I had some successful showcases in uh, LA, but I, I I don't think it was my path. I don't think I'm I'm even good enough to be a professional. It, it's its own thing. But um, so David Tell is probably number one all time. Uh, I do have a minor interesting story. When I was a newspaper reporter in Houston, there used to be a club called the Laugh Stop, owned by Mark Babbitt. That was like one of the like key. Uh, I don't say seminal, but uh storied uh stages and i think bill hicks used to play on it and all the like texas and houston guys um but uh i was doing a story on stand-up comedy in houston and my editor said forget the story on the whole scene pick one person and follow them and do it so i ended up picking sean rouse who uh what oh do you, are you familiar so i i was really the first person to write a story about him so i followed him when he was doing a traffic school at the comedy club and I met his mom and I met his then girlfriend and he was way healthier back then even though he still had the arthritis he wasn't as deep into some of the things that he got into unfortunately later in his life but he was like more of a fresh-faced kid you know relatively healthy so I was very lucky enough to see him at that point in his life uh, and then you know I moved to LA after and I saw him touring with David Tell and others. And I, I think he became a favorite of like Doug Stanhope. And unfortunately, you know, RIP, he passed away years ago. But um, so in addition to uh, Attell, who else? I, man, he, he's the top. I throw out a couple names that you like. Uh, a couple names that I like. If we're talking modern, if we're talking right now, if we're not going back, I would say Mark Norman probably. He's up there right now for me. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let, let's do back and forth. You do what I'll do. Okay. Brian Regan. Brian Regan. That's okay. the best clean comic I've ever seen. Your turn. Uh, my turn. Uh, who else is new? Humana, humana. Uh, Dan Soder. I like Dan Soder a lot. Okay. Oh, I'm spacing on this guy's name, but he has like the beard and he's really acerbic and he talks. Ah. Uh, I can't picture him. Uh, let, let me go Jeff Ross since he is like aligned with David Tell and I met him really briefly at the Hollywood Improv once. And I, 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 I'd say my heyday for stand-up comedy, much like music and sports, is the 80s and 90s. Most of my favorites are going to be from way back then. Um, although there are, you know, there's always some good people coming up in any given profession. But um, I, liked, I liked Dave Chappelle before he became a celebrity. I liked him with his like older stuff, like prior to half baked. Um, um, I lost a I lost a lady friend over Dave Chappelle. That's that's a real story. Well, so get the well. I mean, I guess I I, I kind of freaked out. I'm not going to be honest. Or I'm going to be honest with you. So we go and see Louis C.K. Probably my number one of all time. I know that that's sacrilege because everybody thinks he's Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, right. But, but do your do your homework. The, Hard, hardly Harvey Weinstein. Anyway, right. Louis C.K. So we go see Louis C.K. at the Joe Louis Arena in Detroit. 15,000 people. I've never last, laughed with 15,000 people before. Really, it's a real experience, right? Fast forward a few years later, and uh, I think Sticks and Stones come out. Uh, Dave Chappelle, one of, one of his first specials back on Netflix or whatever. And I remember my, my, my chick and I at the time laughed at Louis. And I, Louis is one of the dirtiest comics ever. But yeah, the, I was a big fan of his back in the day. And now we're watching Chappelle and we get to uh, one of the bits. I don't I don't we don't need to bring it up, but we'll just say she got up and walked out of the room mm. and uh, I tapped like I can't like you can't for me, you can't change your sense of humor in a couple of years. I, I know that that's 
silly to say, but like, I don't know, like, I feel like that's something like your sense of humor can evolve, but I don't want it to trend towards like what the culture thinks should be funny and like it you, still you feel be, guilty for yeah, certain things yeah and, and yes you force yourself to not find something funny yeah and like when she got up and walked out of the room and then she did that classic you know thing where as soon as the uh special ended she stormed the living room and had to tell me what was why it wasn't funny or whatever and i was just like this right. is fucking this i will never i will never put myself in this situation again but that was wild to me like i, I ne never saw that coming out of her but yeah so now N matching now I, ideology is like a big part of relationships yeah and for me now, like it almost makes me like Chappelle more because I don't know, <laughs> some some chick I knew got so fucking offended that like, yeah. you know, whatever. But yeah, so I uh, Mitch Hedberg, by the way, I'll throw that one in there. Mitch Hedberg. Oh, uh, just I mean, I saw him live at the OK, I saw him live at the Laugh Stop record an album. And I, I'm positive one of my laughs I can hear in his album. No, one time. No, because I, I have a very specific like. <laughs> You know, it goes high pitched and I'm almost positive. I heard the album that he recorded at the last stop that day. And I went with my colleague from the Houston, from the Houston press, the Houston uh, alternative news weekly. And I'm positive. One of my laughs made it to his album. Dude. I'm, I, that's funny. You say that yeah, it's, it can't be like three or four days ago. I mentioned Mitch Hedberg and I, and I happen to work with a lot of youngins and they're like, who? And I'm like, Oh, oh man. God damn it, yeah. dude. You're making me stand comedy was better. I mean, it, it, there's always good stuff. In fact, I, I don't do this anymore. Uh, because I feel like comedy has become way more political than it ever was. And sometimes it's hard for me to watch stuff that's like surfing on whatever's trendy now. So I, I tend to like revert back to like the good old days sometimes with the content that I consume. But years and years ago, I used to really be into the Laugh Factory's YouTube page because they would they would have quite a quite a few really funny people. I had no idea who they were, uh, but they would just show like two three four five minute clips of certain jokes and i would just skim through that also there was what was the other one a couple of youtube channels i used to watch with just like kind of more anonymous comedians uh that had some really good jokes but that's the thing with stand-up comedy is everybody has one to five to ten really good jokes but the differentiator is do you have 20 30 40 50 60 minutes of strong material and people were like bobby slayton you see how hard it is to maintain that over years because you know, some of the jokes he was doing back in his heyday, he carried over to more recently. And that's not because he's lazy. That's because it's just that difficult to have a one hour block of nonstop funny content for a live audience. It is, I don't know how they do it. I, I'm not good enough to do it. Um, at my best, I was a five to 10 minute a showcaser, but it, it's an amazing ability that people have that are successful at it. My man. Thank you so much. I mean, the fact that you said Dave Attell, I, you know, I knew you were a good egg before I even reached out to you. But the fact that Dave Attell's up there, I mean, oh, that, the best ever, the best ever. So fucking Without good. And you even mentioned Stan Hope, who's one of my favorites of all time. Like, you're just a goddamn good egg, man. He, I, he's, an, he's an Arizona guy, too. Yes, yes. He is. Doesn't he like kind of like live out secluded? Way he's kind of like there. the mayor of his town. Yeah, yeah. Outside yeah. of Tucson, not even outside of Phoenix, outside of Tucson. So he's in his own little compound out there. Um, dude, I, if you do decide to move forward with, um, a, a continuation of this, I'm there. If you, if there's <laughs> anything, like, I don't even give a shit. If you want to talk about another movie, man, I've had so much fucking fun. I, it, all you yeah, have likewise. to do is, it, it, is look at the, the last, like, I don't know, 10, 15 guests, man, I keep it at a half hour, 40 minutes and it's nothing against them, but it's like, I sometimes like how much fun am I having, you know, like, okay, we've kind of reached our whatever. And I, I really feel like I could go for probably another hour. And of course there's yeah, oh, likewise yeah. about, uh, about 20 more questions that I didn't get to, but fuck it. It is what it is. I have a lot to talk about. That's the thing. You know, in short form content, we all know that audience have short attention spans. I get it. Uh, trust me. But sometimes when you get rolling on a conversation, it's like, there are no easy answers and you have, you really have to get to the root of something to adequately explain it. And hopefully it's a fun conversation during that time so but before i got you out of here i did want to blow a little smoke i just wanted to reiterate i i really enjoyed this piece i don't i know he's your friend and he said that it was shades of clockwork orange well I, he became a friend afterwards okay. i should mention like he he was just a, he was a critic who visited us he happened to like it so i'm like hey jump in on the commentary so uh it, it was it was uh legit i'll say well, that. like because i look at it and you want to know what this piece reminds me of brian loves you 
that's <laughs> I appreciate it. I mean, for real, that, man. Like, that's good. I, I think it is a very unique experience. Like, I, I'm not one of these people that tend to like latch onto, oh, it's a found footage film, so it's this, that, and that. And right. I, I, I hate it right. so much. Yeah. Like to me, it's. I think it stands on its own. I think the less is more is awesome. I think the negative criticism that I heard you talk about in the commentary isn't fucking warranted. Like, if it's not for you, that's one thing. But to kind of shit on it the 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 way that i felt that you, when you were talking about it i just i i don't agree i don't agree with all with it at all i from top to bottom i thought the execution on this whether it be like i said the your your dp your sound designer your writing i thought everything worked from start to finish and uh, the audience once you see this ending you're gonna i mean as if it well i don't i don't want to say that it ends poorly because you did make a good point that we didn't necessarily end, you know, negative or dark it didn't necessarily end that way. But mm. I just I loved it, man. I really did. And I but I, I actually I, I don't know what I like more this conversation or the movie like I'm torn yeah. I'm fucking torn. But I, I do want to tell you, come back anytime, dude. Like you're yeah, open, I appreciate that open, sure. open door policy, man. I think I, I really think that especially in talking to you now, now you're a voice that I want to hear more of. Um, and I don't mean like your actual voice. Like, I mean, whatever you decide to No, your voice is fine. I, but like, I whatever that. you're going to concoct next, whatever you're going to create next, like you got a fan. Now I'm actively writing a uh, zombie short film right now. So we'll see. Hell I'm yeah. trying to shoot it either uh, this summer or after the new year, depending on if I can get some elements together. But I, um, I do, I do kind of think that I'd like to extend Brian loves you and do it a different, um, like kind of a sequel, but shoot it conventionally. That that's on my mind, and uh, I, I as of right now, I think the zombie short film is probably the next thing I'm going to be doing as a bridge between Brian one and potentially Brian two, because I just want to do something completely different before I go back into that world. So, man, I'm there. I'm there if you'll have Appreciate me, it. and I would love to talk about it. Um, thanks, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I hope it. to talk again soon. Uh, we are going to get. Ah, Seth out of here. I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about what's on this uh, disc. Uh, we have two commentaries, two commentaries. We have uh, one that he did, uh, Seth Landau did in 2022. Um, so more recent. We also have the 2008 commentary with not only him, um, but the cast and crew, along with uh, the Joe Blow writer, critic James Oster. Um, you have Alyssa Dowling and uh, professor and religious expert Dr. Philip Baker. And also you have new interviews that I had talked about earlier. You have one with George Went that's 45 minutes. You have one with Tiffany Sheppis that's 50 minutes. You have one with Daniel Roebuck that's an hour. You have uh, uh, one with uh, Brink Stevens that's 32 minutes, like packed to the gills because MVD does shit right. And MVD just has a knack of continuing to release these films that either I've heard of and I'm excited for the re-release or I haven't heard of and they haven't failed me yet. So uh, make sure you check out Brian Loves You, available now. Don't miss out on that. And uh, wow, I'm just blown away by how much fucking fun I had with Seth. <laughs> but, you know, I tend to, I don't know, I'm kind of a pussy. I make sure that I pick guests that I know I'm going to fucking have a good time with. So Brian loves you available now. Ellis Cinema, Seth Landau. Goddamn good egg, that one. All right, we're out of here. Thank <laughs> you.